Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. We're here talking again about Microsoft Times Activision, kind of, as well as an earlier playlist we covered called Activision Times California or something along those lines, California versus Activision. Because if you recall, everything that was related to the Microsoft acquisition of Activision, which is a tough phrase, try saying that three times fast, was related to Activision losing its stock price, losing its valuation, because of a lawsuit brought by the state of California claiming that Activision was a hotbed of sexual harassment and pay discrimination. And so that's a part of this conversation as well. But before we get to that, I do want to mention that this channel is supported by viewers and now listeners like you. And thanks to Podcast AI, our partners, for helping us get the podcast servers back up and running. So if you do enjoy virtual legality or Hangouts and Headlines now, in podcast form, those should be available on your favorite podcast network, Spotify, Apple, Google. Uh, and let me know if there's some place that they aren't that you'd like them to be. I'm very happy that they're there. And thank you to everyone who has listened and reviewed those podcasts when they've been found. So on that note, let's start talking about some of these issues. First and foremost, let's talk about a change in management at Activision. So here's an article from The Verge. Microsoft announces more Xbox leadership changes as Activision's Bobby Kotick departs. And Bobby Kotick was the devil-horned CEO that a lot of people like to vilify as the real bad guy behind Activision and some of its problems. And of course, the fact that he was going to have a job after Microsoft purchased Activision was of some consternation to many. But we knew that he would have a job. We knew he would get what they call a golden parachute. He'd get a lot of money leaving because he's made a lot of money for his investors and ultimately for Activision in his tenure but that Microsoft wouldn't be in the business of having multiple CEOs running things. And so Bobby Kotick was likely to leave a short time after the acquisition was finalized. And this ac acquisition was finalized in October. And now we see these management changes really coming to fruition at the end of December. So first and foremost, Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick is stepping down officially on December 29th this year. Microsoft has not appointed a direct replacement and instead has rolled the suite of Activision Blizzard executives, including Blizzard president and ex-Microsoft executive Mikey Barra, Activision publishing president Rob Kostich, and Activision Blizzard vice chair Thomas Tipple, under Microsoft's game content and studios president, which is itself a new title, Matt Booty. Kodak's departure comes just two months after some big Xbox leadership changes that saw Sarah Bond promoted to Xbox president, leading all Xbox platform and hardware work, and Matt Booty promoted to president of games, content, and studios, including overseeing Bethesda and ZeniMax Studios. Now, Booty is getting even more responsibilities with Bethesda, Activision Blizzard, and Xbox Game Studios, all under his watch. Now, Bethesda and Activision are likely to remain quasi-independent under Mr. Booty and Xbox, but they are kind of consolidating their management structure as we thought they would because they have so many new developers under their purview. and because we've seen certain issues with either the product pipeline at Microsoft and getting content out the door and with the quality of that content once it is received. They had a very good year in 2022, a not as good year in 2023, especially with the release of Redfall and Starfield not quite getting the high acclaim that they wanted it to receive. So with that understood, they've kind of changed up their management structure. They've elevated Phil Spencer to a more CEO of all gaming role and put people under him that used to work at Microsoft proper and then put people under those people with Activision Blizzard and Bethesda to try to make a kind of normal management pyramid at, at Microsoft. And we can only hope as gamers that this results in a good pipeline of high quality content. We don't know what it will happen in the future, but we hope so. Microsoft is largely keeping the leadership team of Activision Blizzard in place with some executive level exceptions. Activision Blizzard Chief Communications Officer Lulu Maservi, also Twitter famous, will leave the company at the end of January. Humam Sakini, I apologize in advance for the pronunciation there, Vice Chairman of Blizzard and King, will also depart at the end of December. A number of Activision Blizzard executives will depart in March too. So as we suggested earlier in this playlist, Microsoft is going to take a firmer hand with Activision, is going to actually have bought something with its multi-billion dollar purchase, and is going to control aspects of Activision that were controlled by others before the acquisition took place. Brian Bulatado, Julie Hodges, Armin Zerza, and Grant Dixon are all reporting to their Microsoft gaming equivalents. 
While Thomas Tipple is reporting to Matt Booty for now, he will depart Microsoft in March alongside other Activision Blizzard executives. And I do note that December and March are very often the dates that you see these kinds of transitions take place. That suggests to me that this is an ordered transition, right? This is all what would be expected here. There aren't people that are jumping ship early. There aren't folks that are breaching contracts or anything like that. December and March are for accounting reasons, good times to have changes in management because the fiscal quarters end there and often the fiscal years, depending on how you keep your accounting books. And so December and March suggest that this is all part of the plan that Microsoft had developed over the course of its very long engagement with Activision due to, of course, the regulatory powers that we've discussed at length on this channel. Microsoft continues to integrate Activision Blizzard into its expanded Microsoft gaming business, and it's clear Matt Booty is now taking more responsibility than ever before, and good luck to them. I want to see great games come out of Microsoft and Activision and Bethesda and everyone else. So I hope very much that this structure is workable for them, that it results in good products. We'll see, ultimately, at the end of the day, whether or not it does work. Here's Phil Spencer's full internal memo, and he talks a lot about all of these changes to his employees. Uh, for most of you, your day-to-day -day work will remain the same. It's still business as usual and bringing more groundbreaking, groundbreaking experiences to more players around the world. I do like how Phil Spencer always writes his emails as if they will be leaked to a uh, media site, as is the case when we read them. Of course, they have been leaked, so it's good that he wrote this way, even though it's a weird way to talk to people that you know. At the leadership level, these changes will provide the clarity and accountability that is necessary to achieve our ambitious goals and foster a culture that is welcoming, empowering, and committed to gaming for everyone. Right. So part of the Activision purchase was that Activision was going through all these troubles with the state of California, with the EEOC, with all of the things that were published about them and their Cosby suite and everything else. And that Microsoft was coming in as a kind of white knight to tell employees and regulators and people that follow the gaming industry that we were going to foster this culture that was more welcoming and, and really help fix whatever was broken at Activision. But that's a part of the story as well. So we'll get to more on that in just a minute. But that's Phil Spencer. Matt Booty then talks a lot about Bethesda, saying we are delighted to welcome the talented game development teams from Activision Publishing, Blizzard, and King to our game studios and content organization. In, in addition, today we are announcing Jill Braff as head of the ZeniMax Bethesda Studios. Jill has a wealth of experience in games and entertainment with previous roles at Nintendo, Sega, Glue Mobile, Home Shopping Network, and at Warner Brothers, building the online and marketing business for The Ellen DeGeneres Show. Really took a turn there in the description of Jill's experience, didn't it? She was our leader for the integration work with when ZeniMax Bethesda joined Xbox, and through that work, she has come to know many of their teams and leaders well. Jill will be responsible for leading the ZeniMax Bethesda game development teams, which will continue to operate as limited integration entities, meaning that they won't be fully combi combined into the Xbox Game Studios concept, but instead operate as their own studios because they've done that successfully for many, many years now. Uh, and they will continue to operate as integrated, limited integration entities, as well as continuing to oversee the Microsoft Casual Games team. Reporting to Jill will be Todd Howard, Todd Vaughn, Matt Theoror, Paul Jensen, and Heather Cooper. Jamie Leader will remain in his role as CEO of ZeniMax Bethesda, reporting to me, and will continue supporting the ongoing integration work. And then they talk about Starfield a little bit, and they talk about what's going on in 2024. But the important part here, for the purpose of our future discussions in this video, is that Microsoft is now putting its thumbprints firmly on Activision, Blizzard, and King. And that that's a part of the story here as we go and look at essentially them taking care of family business now under new management. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. First, we're going to talk about hybrid work, right? So as the pandemic took hold around the world, but in America in general, a lot of these video game companies, a lot of software companies allowed folks to work remotely. Activision has been kind of trying to change that a little bit by asking for hybrid work that you come into the office sometimes and is now ending that hybrid work and asking quality assurance employees to come in all the time, which has created a certain amount of consternation. But again, this is Activision as owned by Microsoft. And this dated article is December 19th. Activision Blizzard is ending its hybrid work model for QA staffers next month. This is actually the day before those announcements of the management changes at Activision. The mandate will result in quality assurance employees in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Austin, El Segundo, returning to office work full time. QA workers were advised of the decision on November 30th, according to ABK Workers Alliance, which is kind of the internal proto-union that is working to advance worker interests at Activision. The organization released a statement, it was a long one, about the decision on social media. In part, the workers group said the job security of many QA employees was already on shaky ground due to the announcement of hybrid work earlier this year. 
meaning that they were allowed to work remotely and then not as much. Since then, hundreds of employees have been in correspondence with the accommodations team to try to receive permanent work from home arrangements due to disability, financial issues, or other factors. Many of these requests have been outright denied, and many more have been offered in-office accommodations that do not adequately meet the needs of employees. It continues, this has resulted in many employees being forced out of the company in a soft layoff. It is our belief that the removal of hybrid work will result in many, many more employees being forced out of the company and into a desperate situa situation. situation. Now, from my view, I think that this is a justified statement insofar as folks got used to working from home and maybe didn't ever have to work in these office environments. And those office environments might not be set to accommodate certain of the disabilities or other needs of the employees that were originally hired in a work from home world. But I do think looking at this statement from the Workers Alliance that it maybe goes a step too far. And it's unclear exactly how Activision is doing them wrong or would be treated better if they had done something else in order to bring people in. This is a fight that is happening not just at Activision or at Microsoft or at tech companies, but across the country and I would gather across the world, although I don't have much view of across the world jurisdictions. I think that the pandemic created a certain expectation of livelihood and work from home environments. And that as employers try to bring people back whether it's slowly, whether it's harshly, however you might view Activision on something like this, that there's going to be resistance to that. But it, as we'll see from Activision's perspective, we made the decision to move from a hybrid work schedule to a full-time in-office working model for these QA folks. We take our support for employees with disabilities, differing abilities, mental health requirements, and changing medical needs seriously. And they say basically that they work better in person, right? So I think there's going to be this push and pull from a lot of these companies. And I don't have any issue with folks saying, hey, we like to work from home. And I don't have any issue with employers saying, okay, but the productivity is down and we have to get up to some level of productivity that makes this whole business model work. Uh, and ultimately it's up to the employers and the employees in each industry and each company to figure out a model that works for them. So this is again, kind of new management. We see IGN talking about this soft layoff. It's, it's a kind of continuing fight between employers and labor, but Microsoft coming in and trying to quote unquote fix things and make it a welcoming community is perhaps making this a little bit less fictitious than it might otherwise be. So here we go with Microsoft also fixing up the other problem that happened with respect to Activision, which is of course the California lawsuit. So this was the first article I saw on this. This was from Video Game News, Video Games Chronicle. Activision Blizzard to pay $54 million to settle discrimination lawsuit, which is a lot of money for you or me, not so much money for a big old company like Activision Blizzard. As first reported by the Wall Street Journal via VentureBeat, and we'll talk about that in just a second, the publisher, which was acquired by Microsoft in October, entered into an agreement with the California Civil Rights Department to settle the case, which is related to claims of unequal compensation and promotion practices on the basis of sex from 2015 to 2020. Now, this is true as amended, but I think it's worth noting for VGC and for those of you that are watching this video, that this is the lawsuit with the Cosby suite. This is the lawsuit from everything that happened with respect to harassment, everything you heard about uh, deaths and potential damages at the company, all of the things that we saw in IGN articles and other outlets that required a disclaimer when they did things like review Activision video games. And that this description of it being only related to unequal compensation and promotion practices is part of the story because what we'll see is the state of California ultimately drops the harassment cases as not being provable, essentially, which I think is as important a part of the story as the settlement itself. Activision Blizzard will pay as much as $46.75 million to female employees who claim they'd received inequitable pay during the period. $9.125 million will cover attorney's fees. And there you see exactly why attorneys and these departments get involved in these cases in the first place. Under the agreement, which is subject to court approval, and yes, since this is a lawsuit, you can't just have the parties settle on their own. They have to settle, and then the court has to say, yes, that is within the realm of fairness, and we're not going to cut it off. And for the most part, courts are unlikely to cut off an agreed-upon settlement, but in this case, with politics and with the state of California being so adamant early on with what it was seeking to prove, it might be the case that a court comes in and says, well, this is an awfully low number for what you were talking about as potential billion-dollar damages. So what are we going to do with this state of California 
is going to be at least a potential question, even though most of these are going to be accepted by a court. So we should assume that it will be accepted, but there is a higher than 0% likelihood that the court says, no, we have to keep going through with this case. This, the California CRD agreed that no court or any independent investigation has substantiated any claims of systemic or widespread sexual harassment at Activision Blizzard, nor that Activision Blizzard senior executives ignored, condoned, or tolerated a culture of systemic harassment, retaliation, or discrimination. And when I commented on this on Twitter, somebody said, wait, they had the Cosby suite, didn't they? Didn't they have evidence of that? Yes, they did. We saw the the pictures from that particular instance, but what they were trying to prove, what they have to prove by the statute is systemic harassment, a problem at the institution, right? Not these kinds of uh, isolated one-off instances. And you have to show that some manager somewhere as part of the power structure of the institution was ignoring it or condoning it or participating in it. And so this suggests that the investigation, despite having that as its pledge, that it was going to show that this was in fact systemic and widespread, was unable to do so. The settlement also said that its investigation found no evidence of wrongdoing by Bobby Kotick, CEO of Activision Blizzard, or its board. And the kicker, the state's expert witnesses testified that a gender pay gap existed overall, but a pay disparity was not found among employees of the same rank. So what they went forward with was that essentially women weren't getting promoted enough but you can't have quotas. Those are illegal under the United States Constitution. You can't discriminate on the basis of sex, even for the benefit of a underrepresented sex. And so you can't have quotas. You can't require specific amounts of women or specific amounts of anybody to take specific amounts of roles in a company. So what you're really looking at is when you get to the same role, when you're performing the same service, equal, equal pay for equal work. And what the state experts witness testified was that Essentially, there might not be enough women in high enough roles at Activision for what they would like to see, creating a pay gap overall, but that there wasn't any disparity between employees of the same rank. So if you recall in our first video on the series here, A Legal Look at California versus Activision, this is one of the issues that I pointed out early on in the state of California's claims is that they tried to establish that folks like Claudine Naughton, the chief people officer only making $4 million, was not making as much as... CEO Bobby Kotick with $154 million. Now, taking aside that a lot of that is options and stock and things that maybe are higher risk than pure salary, uh, it's not the case that the chief people officer, which would be the head of human resources in other companies, is doing the same job as the chief executive officer. We would expect a difference in pay there, and that isn't necessarily evidence of sex discrimination in the interest of pay. And the fact that they use it in their opening gambit to try to establish it was cause for concern. And as it turns out, the state of California doesn't look like they were ever able to prove anything of the kind. California remains deeply committed to promoting and enforcing the civil rights of women in the workplace, said their civil rights department director, Kevin Kish, and then has a lot more quotes here that we'll take a look at in just a second. But I did want to give credit to this original Venture Beat story, as I like to, when they're available and not paywalled. So this is the Venture Beat story, Activision Blizzard to settle California unequal pay case for $56 million. And you see here, the California CRD will file an amended claim withdrawing all allegations of systemic harassment related according to reports from the Wall Street Journal and documentation viewed by VentureBeat. This settlement will resolve the amended claim that focuses solely on claims of unequal compensation and promotion practices on the basis of sex from 2015 to 2020. It's actually a little bit more than that. And I can say that because I have seen the settlement agreement itself. The state's ex expert witness testified that a gender pay gap existed overall, but a pay disparity was not found among employees of the same rank. This data aligns with the company's pay equity review for 2020 and its 2023 transparency report. The amended claim and settlement agreement will be filed in court early next week. And so you're starting to see a story here of exactly why Activision responded the way it did. And I'm not saying that that response was proper. If you go look at the playlist, I thought it was over the top with respect to claiming that California was just on a political crusade against the company. But it does seem like coming off the heels of the $100 million settlement with Riot, who makes League of Legends, that California maybe was sowing its oats a little bit and going after other big fish like Activision Blizzard with maybe a little bit less to go on than they might have projected out to the media or to us, which you could kind of see in reading the legal documents themselves, which hopefully you did here in virtual legality. But I do think it's an important part of the story from a kind of hangouts and headlines perspective, because so many people did run with this and so much of the 
coverage of Activision Blizzard King was based on these harassment claims that were not more than two pages of the overall complaint, when so much of it was based on widespread and systemic discrimination that ultimately they had to walk back. Now, in their quotes here, they don't talk much about harassment. Civil Rights Department announces settlement agreement to resolve employment discrimination and equal pay lawsuit against Activision Blizzard. And it's interesting how that is, in fact, what the lawsuit was about. That's how I described it in this playlist. But when folks were talking about the lawsuit on various video game outlets, you saw it really referred to as the sexual harassment lawsuit. Since they were dropping that claim, they don't call it that in this press release. They resolve allegations that Activision Blizzard, Blizzard Entertainment, and Activision Publishing discriminated against women at the company, including by denying promotion opportunities and paying them less than men for doing substantially similar work. If approved by the court, this settlement agreement represents a major step forward and will bring direct relief to Activision Blizzard workers. At the California Civil Rights Department, we will continue to do our part to fight for the rights of our state residents. In the lawsuit filed before the Los Angeles County Superior Court, the department sought relief on behalf of the state of California and a class of women employees and contract workers who allegedly experienced discrimination in compensation promotions and other aspects of Activision Blizzard's workplace. Now, let's talk about how this is going to work in practice, right? You see $54 million settlement. That's a little bit of a highball number because so much of it is going to the attorneys, $9 million plus. But of the four, $45 million remaining, it's going to be divided amongst all women employees that worked at the company in these specific years, as well as women employees that worked there in 2023, because they are part of the PAGA class or the Private Attorney General's Act class that worked with the uh, other departments in California to bring suit against Activision Blizzard King. And so there's money that is going to go to the, these people that is divided amongst the time that they've spent at the company. So when you talk about a 10,000 employee company, along with the women that are contractors to the company, then you're talking about a number that's really going to divide that $46 million by a lot of people. And so it's probably not going to be a ton of money for any given person. It's going to be divided relatively equally in accordance with the time spent at the company by the state of California. And any money that isn't otherwise claimed or checks that aren't cashed is going to be delivered as part of the residual fund to various charities dedicated to workers' rights in California. So that top line number is going to be spent by Activision, but it isn't a huge number for a company so big, and any given person probably isn't going to get a lot of money out of that. The other aspect of that I wanted to comment on that you won't see summarized here is that if any of these particular women took part of the settlement with the EEOC, which you remember the California tried to block earlier in this process, then the money they receive from the EEOC is going to be counted double against what they can receive from the state of California. So if they received a thousand bucks from the EEOC, it counts as two thousand dollars against what number California would have given them. And so in all of that, you're not going to see a lot of big time checks going out to any specific person at Activision. It doesn't seem to be related specifically to the job itself, but more divided amongst time with some kind of minimum bar that isn't established in the settlement document that California will establish as the floor for what they can actually pay any given woman that worked at Activision. If the court approves the settlement, covered workers will receive further information and updates from a settlement administrator, which will be put together by Activision to essentially get this money out to all these people. And then it says, hey, call us if you know of other discrimination elsewhere. And that's the state of California's position. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about how this has been received in various quarters, because I think since the media covered this as it did in gaming with all these disclaimers and with these articles, it's important to talk about the fact that much of this was dropped and that Activision Blizzard King probably didn't deserve all of the vitriol that people put at it as a part of this. Uh, and I think it's also important to take this whole issue, this entire process, into account when we think about the next time an article like that happens, right? That you have to go through the process. You have to see how things play out when a state makes a claim, when the company vehemently denies it, when the opposite happens, whatever it might be, to really evaluate that there are two parties, each that has a self-interest in proving one or the other wrong, and that ultimately the truth probably lies on one side of the, one side or, the other, or somewhere in the middle, and that we don't just have to take documents that are allegations at face value. That said, we do see some politicizing of even this move by California. Here is an article from the Wall Street Journal. It's not about your liver. It's actually about California, but ads are big, aren't they? 
Oh, this is an article from uh, the Wall Street Journal, which, as you can tell from the headline, is going to be a little bit editorializing. Behind California's surrender on Activision Blizzard. And the very first line kind of gives up its particular stance. Progressive regulators and plaintiff's attorneys often make unsubstantiated accusations against companies that are amplified by the press, only to quietly walk them back later. That's essentially what happened with California's hyped lawsuit against video game maker Activision Blizzard for allegedly discriminating against women. And yes, even the harassment claims were framed in the context of if you're harassing women, that that is a discriminatory act, that you aren't harassing men uh, at the same level and that you're making an unsafe work environment for women at your company. The California Civil Rights Department and Activision late last week agreed to settle the government's lawsuit for $55 million total. This is a small fraction of the nearly $1 billion in damages for which the agency earlier claimed Activision could be liable. Activision admits no wrongdoing, and the agency concedes in the settlement it couldn't prove any. Yet the state presented the allegations in its July 2021 lawsuit as definitive. It asserted female workers were subject to constant sexual harassment, including groping, and that corporate management retaliated against those who complained. Activision, the state alleged, fostered a sexist culture by paying women less than men and promoting them at slower rates. Now, the promoting them at slower rates thing I don't think is quite defeated by what the settlement says. Insofar as there is a pay disparity of some kind at Activision, it's possible that the promotion is unequal, but we can't speak to any given situation because we don't know the merits of the people involved. The press piled on with dispatches about Activision's purported fraternity culture. Then came news that the Securities and Exchange Commission was investigating the company's handling of misconduct complaints. Activision's stock value plunged $20 billion between when California filed its lawsuit and Microsoft's offer to buy the company in January of 2022. In a very real sense, the state of California cost Activision its independence, right? It, it made it attractive to a company like Microsoft to purchase by losing that much market presence. Uh, and so that's an important part of this story. Now, do I think it's quite as bad as all this? Would I have characterized this as progressive regulators and plaintiff's attorneys? No, I don't really view this as fully political as much as I see it as kind of a state money grab uh, when they saw how much they got from Riot and seeing Activision with some similar style complaints maybe made their, their eyes get the little cartoon dollar signs in them. But I don't quite see it as politically as the Wall Street Journal. Doesn't make them wrong, but it does make it very highly editorial. California's lawsuit was soon undermined by the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's $18 million settlement against Activision for similar allegations. California regulators tried to block the settlement in federal court because the monetary relief it granted to women could reduce the amount the state could recover in its lawsuit. That would have meant a much smaller windfall for plaintiff's firm Outen and Golden, which represented the state in the lawsuit. The government union representing state attorneys hilariously sued the state for outsourcing legal work in the case. For once, the interests of public unions and the public coincided. Obviously, a lot of politics in this article. Spearheading the lawsuit was the agency's then chief counsel, Jeanette Whipper, a longtime friend of the plaintiff's bar with a history of making dubious complaints. She had previously overseen the U.S. Labor Department's West Coast Federal Contractor Compliance Office when it accused Google of systemic discrimination. Google settled the complaint after she left for $3.8 million. The agency's shakedown of Activision and similarly unfounded allegations against Tesla for racial discrimination drew Governor Gavin Newsom's attention. In April 2022, he removed Ms. Whipper. She then accused Mr. Newsom of improperly meddling in her lawsuit. Why is it inappropriate for a governor to fire a state employee who is harassing businesses? The state is now finally conceding that its allegations against Activision were unsupported. The settlement agreement says no court or any independent investigation has substantiated the agency's allegations of systemic or widespread sexual harassment, or that senior executives ignored, condoned, or tolerated a culture of systemic harassment, retaliation, or discrimination. Activision is essentially paying the state to admit it shouldn't have brought the lawsuit. This is what passes as legal justice in California. And I think you get the idea from the Wall Street Journal here. There's a bit more, but... This is a point of politics for some, and certainly for Activision, if you look at the comments that they made that claim that California was just acting politically, they do appear to be vindicated in part, even though I would not have gone out with the messaging that they did. And you have it reported in places like The Hollywood Reporter. You have it reported in places across the internet and across the news cycle. So this is a big deal for both California and Activision Blizzard, and it goes again to the notion that Microsoft is out there making changes at the company level, right? You don't see Activision necessarily arriving at this settlement with the state of California, both because of those early comments that I think really put the state on tilt, but also because of the overall stance that Activision was taking towards kind of negotiated positions with respect to this. It's also easier for a new purchaser, a new owner of the company 
to say, let's just walk this back. Let's have cooler heads prevail on something like this. When Activision and Bobby Kotick and the folks that ran the company during the years in question would have more emotional investment in saying that they did nothing wrong, right? So Microsoft can get in there and do this in perhaps a little bit easier of a fashion than the old guard at Activision, even if they were the best people in the world. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Bobby Kotick and the old guard at Activision are the best people in the world, but it is worth noting how different a new manager can be in questions like this. Now, that's really all I wanted to talk about is to note the differences between how Activision was running prior, how Microsoft coming in changes things, takes care of family business. As I said, we can expect this, I think, going forward into the future with any other things that they have to clean up at Activision. But that overall, if you were hoping for Microsoft to come in and make changes at the company, this settlement also represents that. There's an entire section of the settlement that includes getting a consultant in there to report on any further issues that are at the company and to act on those issues. A whole big process that was agreed to with the state of California that Activision might not have agreed to on its own. And if you want to see a good, safe work environment for these employees, for the gaming industry in general, I think overall this looks like a good step in the right direction. It doesn't mean Microsoft is without blame or without harm on any of these things. They have their own issues to deal with and history of dealing with regulatory bodies. But I think this is a good step for those that are interested in a good workplace for the folks that make things like Diablo and Starfield and other games that you might enjoy. That said, like I've said before, this is a channel supported by viewers and listeners like you. Please do check out the links below to player or Patreon if you'd like to support the channel or memberships to this to the channel or Super Chats. Every bit helps, and I'm reminded to go check the Super Chats when I hit that button. So just hang on for a second with me as I go and check to make sure I don't miss any Super Chats. Oh, and of course I hit the wrong button there, so just hang on. We do have one Super Chat from RC Polygons. Do you think Microsoft would replace Bobby or just not have a CEO of Activision Blizzard King? Since it looks like each head of Activision Blizzard King reports to Matt Booty, so there would there need to be a CEO of Activision Blizzard? I don't think there is technically a need for a CEO at any of these companies, except to the extent that you want them to remain at least quasi-independent. So a CEO is going to control strategy of a company. So if you're a subsidiary, you don't necessarily need that role filled, but you still need somebody that's going to be more aware of information on the ground than maybe higher up in the management architecture. So I, I do think that there's likely to be a CEO but it won't be a CEO with the power and general authority of a Bobby Kotick. It will be a different type of CEO that reports to Matt Booty or potentially even to Phil Spencer if they wind up changing the structure again. So I think that role is likely to be filled, but it isn't required with what Microsoft has done so far. Thank you so much for the super chat and for support of the channel. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who's been participating in these uh, discussions. I do want to mention now at the end of this video that this is the last video I think for the channel of the year. It's obviously been a difficult year and I know that I haven't covered all of the folks that have sponsored episodes either in group or individually through the Patreon or player. I do mean to hit that. Please do send me an email if you think that you have supported the channel and haven't otherwise seen your name pop up as one of the sponsors. Unfortunately, because I was out for six months or so without even checking the channel, the Services don't really account very well for missing that time and, and not knowing exactly who should be otherwise credited for those things. So please do let me know. I don't want to miss anybody, but it is a tricky thing to figure out a year on exactly who should be getting sponsorship. So please do let me know. And I am so, so thankful to be here talking with you all on these things. If you have questions or comments about the topics of this video, please do let me know now, either at Hoglaw or with question or with Super Chat or anything else, Super Chats, memberships, all that, not a requirement, but I do get flagged on them a little bit more easily to see than some other forms of questions. Happy end of 2023, Hoag, says Sardinisms. I'm so happy to see your recovery and see you back and feeling better. Looking forward to 2024. I am also looking forward to 2024. We start again, as will be my stance for the start of the new year, and I think that it's going to be a great one. We're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be less stressful than the last start of the year for me. So I'm very glad that we get to experience it together and we get to talk about things like this. Thank you, Sardinisms, for all the support. I know it says member for one month, but it got reset. So thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's here. I really, really do appreciate it. We have more than 200 folks here. So many of you stuck with the channel, even though I was 
basically only doing bit casts and lawyers and dragons for six months out of the year. Uh, I'm so glad to be back. I'm so glad to be able to talk a little bit closer to what I was talking like last year. And I do also like Sardinisms want to give a shout out to co-counsel. Mrs. Hoglaw, you are a hero. Saved my life. hundred percent, hundred percent dead. Couldn't do it without her. Couldn't do any of this without her this year. And so thank you so much to Mrs. Hoglaw. She's awesome. And I look forward to getting to see her after this show is done. Uh, happy holidays, reasonable minds, says Marissa M. Thank you, Marissa. Absolutely. Reasonable minds can differ. They may differ. They will differ. And that's okay. And we can enjoy each other's company and conversations, even at the holidays, with what I am sure are very many differing minds within your own holiday family groups. So do try to remember that when you otherwise want to get into a fight over the holidays on some issue or another, that even your drunk uncle can be a reasonable mind in the right context. Uh, Clansom says, as a manager, he's being asked to come in more and more. Uh, with respect to somebody that's doing hybrid work, I suspect so. Emily Aarons, happy holidays to you and your family and all the hoagies. I will definitely relay that, Emily. Thank you so much, and I love the picture. Thank you for being a member here at the channel. I really appreciate it. And it's going to be a good year. I can almost promise. Kelly Seasons, this will be the last one before the Rose Bowl. Go blue. Maize and blue. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing the Michigan football team's playoff game this time. So it should be fun. Uh, called Weeb. Thank you so much for the super chat. Hogue, thank you for making these legal issues more digestible for the average consumer slash gamer. Happy holidays. I do try my best and I'm very appreciative of the folks that get me things like the settlement agreement so that I could take a look at it myself. I could see the summaries and the summaries were good. The summaries adequately covered uh, what is in this settlement agreement, but there are little bits and pieces that I did want to highlight for you in a video like this one. Thank you so much. I'm glad that it's working for you. I'm glad to be back doing these things. And to some of the commenters that said, hey, I wish we were still doing the capsule videos and not the live videos. I understand completely. It just so happens that this structure has worked for me in a post-stroke world uh, in a way that the previous video tapings was just not working for me for reasons that are beyond my ken, honestly. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a neurologist. Uh, but I'm so thankful that folks have jumped on to these live streams, and I do prepare them just like I used to prepare the capsule videos. So hopefully you're not seeing too much of a difference, except for when we get to these parts at the end where we talk about questions and comments and things. So thank you so much, Cast the Sass, for being a member for so long. Merry Christmas to you and the family. Merry Christmas to you, Cast the Sass. So thrilled to be here with you again. Have a happy and safe holiday. I love the hat, by the way. So yes, have a wonderful holiday to everybody. Have great times with your family, your friends, and do give them a hug, right? Check your blood pressure, hug your loved ones. It was just about a year ago when I didn't know whether I'd be here with you for all. So please do take the time to tell the folks you love that you love them because you never know. Drake Son, book might. Merry Christmas to all. Thank you for the super chat, Drake Son. Uh, Merry Christmas to all. And to all a good night, I think. Or good morning. Depends on your time zone, really. Nishe Jones, thank you for being a member. Happy holidays to all of Team Hogue. Absolutely, happy holidays. Uh, we're going to have a fun one here. We're going to have, hopefully, a relaxing time as we get back up to speed. And in 2024, we start again. Eddie says, so glad to be here, no matter the format. Well, I just really appreciate it, because I know I've had to shift things around. You can see me trying to work through exactly what this channel was going to be in the middle of the year. Uh, and finding a way to make this work for me was really important, because I like doing this. I like having these conversations. And hopefully... I like getting more and better information about these topics out to everyone so that the next time a story like this comes around, you maybe don't even need to check the channel. You can look at these things with a critical eye. You can evaluate for yourself and you can determine how you think about these things because of some of the information, hopefully, that has been imparted through a channel like this one. So thank you so much, Eddie. Emily says, so glad you're here and doing so well. I am too. I really am. I, I, I like this world. I like this life. I like talking about these things with you all. I was thinking about that the other day, actually, while watching the Fox series Prison Break, actually, if you can believe it. I was thinking, it's nice to just watch a dumb show and to be able to enjoy this time with my family. So thank you very much, Emily. I appreciate it. Sardinisms, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. See you all in 2024. So happy to see all the positivity in the chat to round out the year. Smiley face emoji. 
absolutely Sardinisms. I love that this community can be as positive as it is. I know there's a lot going on in the world. We don't have to turn a blind eye to any specific thing that is worth conversation or discussion, but we also don't have to succumb to just kind of darkness, depression, and cynicism. And I've said, stood for that for as long as I've been alive, and I will continue to stand for that here. So thank you so much, Sardinisms. I appreciate it. And an emoji read along is a bonus. Yes, I still read the emojis around here, folks. I just do. <laughs> uh, all right. Do I have any plan on coming to Japan? Asks that MF Wolf. Actually, Japan is one of the areas where I, I know my daughters would very much like to see. So who knows? Definitely not the year revenue-wise for that. No upcoming global trips for the Hogue family. But maybe someday. Certainly on the list. Eddie Hogue, it pained me, but I did, in fact, pick Michigan for our family's Bowl Series champion. I guess they deserve a full champion since Nebraska won in 1997. I'm sorry. I don't know. I can't I can't hear you. Uh, 1997, the Michigan Wolverines were the, were the football champions. Nebraska, I, I think, tried to claim a half championship because of some reporters, but I'm not going to allow that. Uh, so, no, I, I can understand that, and we'll see what happens in the in the playoff. Certainly. Nick Saban and the five stars at Alabama are going to put up a heck of a fight uh, in the in the first playoff game, and we'll see what happens from there. I am hopeful about Michigan in this upcoming Rose Bowl. I think it would be a great time for Michigan to really show up, but I'm informed that the TCU game didn't go so well for them, even though I didn't see it. So I don't know that it ever happened. Papa Rick asks for Hogue travel vlogs in the future. Yes, it'll just be a series of posts about how much I hate airports. Like, uh, we're here three hours early for our flight that just got delayed by two hours. And the local airport Chili's is charging $14.99 for its chicken fingers. Having a great one. How are you doing? I'm sure it would be an exciting blog. <laughs> Kelly says the TCU game doesn't exist. I honestly, people keep referencing what happened in it. It, it sounds like an alternate reality. So I don't know. <laughs> all right folks well i think we're just about done here today uh thank you so much for being with the channel this year thank you so much for being with me this year thank you so much for all the support i've said it before as part of the stroke series but i got so much support so many nice letters so many prayers and well wishes and just general statements of kindness while i was in the hospital even while i was home from the hospital that it really did help my recovery it helped buoy me all year long Thank you so much to all of you, and I really appreciate your presence. Have a great holiday season. Merry Christmas if you celebrate, and do spend time with your friends and family. Tell them that you love them. So, so important this time of year. So, so important all times of year, but definitely during the holidays. Check in on folks. Check your blood pressure, and I will see you the next time we do a video on the Hoaglaw YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.